That's what he said. My name is Matt Weaver. I'm regional enforcer, Texas State Enforcer Service. Um, my back, I've been with the agency almost nine years in January, and prior to that, I worked for Trees for Houston for 10 years, uh, managing their tree planting program. So I probably killed uh, more trees than most of y'all have ever planted combined. Um, and learned a lot through that experience. Um, and Wendy had asked me to come here to talk about forestry. Uh, that is my background. I went to CMF Austin. My background is in forestry, but my emphasis in school was urban and community forestry. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. My region is basically the Houston region. There are now two of us uh, in the urban forestry program here in Houston. I go almost all the way to Orange over to Victoria. Um, as an agency though, we have about 500 employees and there's only 10 of us that do the urban and community forestry um, program through the state of Texas, which is kind of interesting because 90% of the population of Texas and most of the United States now live in urban areas. So yet through our program of 500 people, we have 10 of us where all the people are. So my, my basically my customers are communities, our cities, um, we help them develop programs to have trees, uh, main trees, to really see what resources they have and understand the benefits of those resources because I heard that there's like a thousand people that move to Texas every day and in about 25 years our population is almost going to double. So that puts an extreme pressure on our natural resources. Well, I know some of the other guys have been talking about, you know, what, you know, prairies and and this and that, but where we typically work is, you know, when we think about forestry in Texas, even that's changed, even since I was in school. You think about the, the timber companies and how much land they own and how much timber they they manage, this is, is significantly different than it was when, even when I was in school and, and back in the, you know, and I'll get into that as we go through this little more. But, you know, we all know we're growing and we're big and it's not gonna decrease anytime soon and so, um, so that's what, you know, I, don't, I think when people hear Forest Service, they do think more of that rural forest and, and really the landowner, uh, you know, demographics changing. There's not these properties that are hundreds of thousands of acres anymore. They're getting broken up. So it, it's changed quite a bit. So is the timber industry and, and forestry in general in Texas and really the southern United States. So um, this is really kind of interesting. But a lot of what our agency does is we are, um, you know, we think about wildfires and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, we are the agency uh, that handles wildfires when the local fire department can't. So we are the wildfire, you know, and that's where our big numbers come in. That's where most of our employees are in the somewhat related or tied to the forest or the uh, forest wildfire program. Um, so that's why I you know, just had to clarify that because you know, that's not something I do typically, although back in 2011, um, you know, all of us are doing a little bit of that, and I'll get into that real quick too. And I'm not going to talk too much about vegetation as far as vegetation. I know Wendy had talked a little bit about, or asked me to talk a little bit about what Texas looked like, or what this area looked like, um, you know, in the past. And it really depends on how far you go back, and I won't get into that because I know Andy probably talked a lot about the soils and the geology and all that, so I won't talk about that. Um, but this is put this up to remind me, you know, Texas is big and it's very diverse. Um, in fact, even just our region is very diverse. You know, I go one part of town in the Piney Woods, you know, then I'm in the Prairie, then I'm down the Columbia Bottomland, so it's, which is really interesting, and you don't have to go too far to, to get that change, so that's pretty, pretty cool, or pretty unique to Texas, and then obviously when you go out west, there's not many trees, right? Um, in fact, the guy that I worked with for years, some of you may know, Mickey Merritt, he's now our um, forester in our uh, actually, the office is an alpine, but now his territory is Big Bend, Davis Mountains. So I really feel bad for him right now. <coughs> but of course, he's dealing with a totally different type of tree population, and, tree, and and he's still in the urban program. Yet he's working on a ponderosa pine restoration project with Nature Conservancy out in the Davis Mountains. So I mean, our jobs are pretty cool. We get to do a lot of stuff. Um, I do a lot of this kind of educational training and training staff for Parks and Rec and things like that. So I do a lot of educational stuff, but. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and take a look at, I, I just thought this was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, I know that's probably not real PC, but, but I was thinking about that and I was like, when is, and I looked it up and it's actually, ma these maps are from 1972. So that's why we have <coughs> Indians up there. Um, but it's kind of interesting because really, I think, think about Texas and the landscape in the South, I mean, it really started changing when people were around, right? Prior to, um, you know, civilization and settling and everything, 
Texas is, you have to really understand that Texas is a fire state. Fire ran through on a regular basis through the state of Texas, and it just, that's the way it was. And so that really kind of controlled and determined what vegetation types were there. And over, and obviously now that's not the case. Um, obviously because of the population and people and things that we don't you know, prescribe burning and burning in general has been suppressed. And that completely changes what the vegetation types are when you have suppressed something that was natural for thousands of years. And so we don't really have that component in our landscape as a whole. Now we do use it to manage certain areas, but really, you know, this area probably didn't have a lot of trees except for those areas that were really wet, like riparian areas, wetlands, things like that, where fire probably wasn't as, as good to get into just because of the moisture. But we had way more prairies, and, we, and probably Houston in general really didn't have probably a lot of trees except in those areas that were, you know, stayed wet or around riparian areas. So, and maybe that, and if some of our first settlers, you guys probably already know this, um, well, I always find it fascinating and interesting, but this is an old picture, or not, it is an old picture, but you know, kind of depicts what it might look like as on some of the coastal areas. You know, this is when man or land started getting managed with fire. That you know, the Native Americans did use fire to manage uh, land and clear land and use it, you know, for all sorts of stuff. So that's really when the landscape, you know, was was changing. But yet they still came, you know, have that have that landscape that where fire was was natural and it came through on a regular basis. Um, and I'll talk more about Eopon Holly then. But it probably was a lot of Eopon Holly, just like it is now, actually. I mean, just, you know, driving in here, you know, you think about the vegetation just on this campus, and that's not necessarily a healthy forest. Um, and really, it's because, well, you're not controlling the undersoil, you're not controlling all that fuel, all that. And I'll get more into that, too, when we talk a little bit more about fog. Um, but some of these areas like Columbia Bottomlands probably look very similar to what they look like now. I mean, minus the areas that are, have been developed, obviously. Where you see, you know, the, the palmettos and the live oaks and things like that in those areas, you know, further down by the Gulf and the, the coastal areas. Um, and this is, this used to be the state champion live oak got dethroned because of some disagreements on where to measure how they because the rules change all the time on measuring trees, I don't know why, but this is not considered more than one tree, which we know it's not, but because of the rules on measuring, this got dethroned. Um, whereas, you know, we measured here originally all the way around. This was my first week at TFS, <laughs> But this is pretty close uh, to this area. This is in the uh, um, wildlife management area in Pretoria. Um, pretty cool tree. You can actually take a path and a trail that goes right down to it. But it's probably very similar to what it looked like. But you do notice that there's tons of yopon in there, tons of tons of uh, understory. So obviously, fire is a, a, a big component of this region right now. Um, so we came out to a property. Someone was interested and thought this could be an Indian marker tree, what they call Indian marker trees, where Native Americans would take trees, usually in an area where it was to mark something significant. They would pull them over and continue to you know hold them over, and they start to grow that way. And, Interestingly enough, we found a, uh, a natural spring right by the street, so it could have been a marker, but I thought that was pretty cool. Um, obviously, like I said, the vegetation probably looks similar in those areas that are wet because fire didn't get in <coughs> um, This is up, I think, in the Spring Creek Greenway area. So when we're talking about forestry in East Texas, the uh, piney woods, this is a picture in our, and I can pass this around, but it came out with a book, uh, basically the history of the Texas Forest Service and forestry in Texas. Um, we just had our 100th year centennial as an agency. Um, so there's a lot of really cool old pictures in here and how forestry and, and Texas kind of uh, morphed and grew. And, uh, you know, look at that. But this picture is in that book. I thought this was really cool. This is a Longleaf Pine stand. Um, Longleaf Pines um, in the south and in East Texas were pretty common. Um, and this is what they look like. And this isn't what a typical forest looks like when you go out and look in the woods typically or that hasn't been managed. Um, but I think even there's some records of the, you know, when the Spanish came and when they were uh, cruising across Texas, you could literally go from this area region like all the way to Nacogdoches and this is what it looked like. And it was, you know, and that, this is why I was bringing up the U of H campus here 
you know, get in an area where you have something that hasn't been managed and it would take you probably two hours to get from one side of the campus to the other to try to get through all the, the vines and everything in it. And it's because, you know, that understory is like that. So longleaf pine is a fire dependent tree species, meaning that it requires fire for it to, to get to that climax forest. Um, and what longleafs do is they stay in this uh, grass, what we call a grass stage, where it literally looks like this huge tuft of grass. Um, and that's for protection. So when fires go through regularly, they burn really fast and quick. When we get, when you when you have all the fuel loads in here and you have a drought or whatever, it gets super hot and then that's when it starts getting and jumps up into the crown. But if fire goes through an area on a regular basis, they burn really fast and they burn quick. So a lot of those plants aren't gonna die. They're just, you know, really keeping down the competition is what it's doing. Um, and so, and that's one of the reasons we don't have mature old you know virgin long lake pine stands anymore is because we've suppressed fire so now we have lava lake pine which is a native but um not as fire dependent as the long lake pine um but this is an old picture i forget the year on this but early 1900s i think 18 maybe late 18s but that's that pretty cool then you know as in, <laughs> as we tend to do um, you know, we were start, We started really using those natural resources. I mean, the timber industry was pretty huge in East Texas. Um, that's why the college I went to was established, basically, was, uh, the forestry school there because of the timber industry. Um, so we started logging all this and suppressing fire, really. That's kind of what really, I think, changed the vegetation, not just in Texas, but across the United States, really. Um, and that's why we have these big, huge fires now, is because because of the suppression of fire, when a fire does get in now, they burn just, I mean, there's so much fuel that they just burn so hot and so big that we can't contain them or control them anymore. Um, and that's why we have a, I mean, it even happens in some of the national parks, you know, yellow, remember the Yellowstone fires in the, what, the late 80s? And you look at the great, but, um, you know, it's just, just kind of the way it is. And this is really typically what probably a lot of East Texas look like because of fire, um, you know, but, like I said, this is, this is the fire in, near, I think this is one of the ones near Bastrop that happened in 2011 after the drought. And this is how fires burn when you can't control the fuel loads or, or don't have fire, you want to do it on a regular basis. But I just thought it was a really cool picture. This was in the 2011 fires after the drought. Um, this is the Davis Mountains and the, the observatory. Mm. So it doesn't just burn for us. I mean, that stuff burns out there too. In fact, that's really where most now, not even in the drought, that's where a lot of our, we're fighting a lot of fire problem. This is actually, these were all taken in around Austin, Bastrop fires. Um, you know, 2011 was the worst uh, fire year, but also worst drought year. They, they obviously, they correlate. Um, you know, it's the worst one we have in recorded history. And, you know, like I said, we've got people, structures, lives, you know, that's all concerned. Um, but the fuel loads now in some of these areas are just crazy. So a lot of one of our programs is what we call WUI, which is the Wildland Urban Interface. Is these areas that are, you know, people are wanting, especially out in Central Texas, you know, they still want to have kind of that sort of, I live in the, you know, country, not really country, but close to a lot of, you know, wooded vegetation. And unfortunately, you know, their, the fuel load goes right up to their houses. So we, we have a program that really helps people uh, manage that and helps communities manage their fuel, really. Um, and if you, you know, your, your community can get certified and all this kind of stuff, but we do a lot of that. Uh, so this was interesting because this is near Austin and all the, to show you how dangerous and crazy wildfires are, I mean, there's a, you know, if you know this, there's a fire truck right there that got dumped on. So what, you know, we, we just want to try to prevent it getting to this. Um, hopefully we'll, we won't see that again. There's unfortunately a lot of folks realize now what, especially even just locally here, like Memorial Park, you look at, um, you know, people wanted to leave that alone and not touch it, not manage it. And that was probably one of the places we had the greatest loss of mm -hmm. trees uh, during the drought, as far as looking at one area. And because it wasn't managed, where they, people wouldn't let it be managed because they wanted it natural, right? And they, they just obviously didn't know, um, well, if you don't have fire, it's not natural. It's natural. <laughs> So I'll get a little bit into general forestry stuff. Like I said, I know this is part of what you guys have uh, to get ready for this, but um, 
obviously it's just in stuff I do anymore, so it's like giving me flashbacks from forestry school. So, um, and then and then Texas in general, you know, like I said, the landscape's changed a lot. I mean, we're still doing this. Um, and there's always going to be home building, and there's some different markets now. Um, the wood pellets. Um, there's even a, in Europe right now, they're doing a lot of commercial um, building now using wood um, and some different processes. And I think that's I hope and think that that's really going to take off here in the states where we're going back to to using more natural materials for large commercial buildings. And so it's really cool. It's beautiful stuff. So hopefully. You know, different markets are going to hopefully help help us out here as far as our timber industry. But um, so I'll go through these kind of quick. I'm sure you guys have all seen this stuff. Um, you know, typically when you do have you know fires, well, this is an even inch stand, so everything's close. <coughs> that's what that is um, in a managed area. Really. Um, uneven. Obviously, you've got your understory, midstory, upper story. Um, you know, when we go in and do, when we do go in and harvest timber, we, you know, hopefully we'll weave some seed trees, uh, stuff that's going to help produce the next generation of trees in there. So it's really just a little more higher density of the seed uh, trees. Um, and then of course we have a lot to do with site prep. Burning is one of those things we can use, and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, but there's a lot of different methods for that, machine planting, hand planting. And really a lot of these areas, if you didn't do anything, they would naturally, you know, get regeneration in there. But this is just to speed up the process of a managed site. You know, those are actually my kids right there. I'm not mm -hmm. They're 10 and 12 now. Mm -hmm. And that, this wasn't, we were actually playing long leaf pine in the, uh, uh, in the big thicket. They are doing some long leaf restoration over there. I have to go back there and see if it was pretty Oh yeah. Um, but anyway, this is one of the reasons that we do use uh, fire as a tool, uh, prescribed burning. Um, and, you know, these are the reasons that we do it, just like I was talking about. You know, we do so fuel load. It does really help keep out invasive species, um, improves the wildlife habitat. You know, you've got your, your seed source down there, you're giving, you know, alleviating the competition. Um, and like I said, Accessibility and aesthetics. I mean, a lot of you know, like I said, we look at a forest and we see all green and we think that's healthy, and not, that's not necessarily the case. So, these are just some pictures of kind of before, during, and after. That far left is what most everywhere looks like if you don't do anything. I mean, most of Memorial Park look like that. A lot of this campus looks like that. Um, and then, you know, this is the burn. I think right, you know, the year after, a couple years after, and then a few years. So it really does what it's supposed to do, really. Um, obviously, we're not going to clear and burn in, in the riparian areas. Um, so we typically try to, to <coughs> encourage leaving them. Um, just for <coughs> some of the cleanest, healthiest water that we have in the world comes out of forested land. So um, we're just looking at sort of a, as far as from a management point or standpoint, this is what it, or how we classify the fine hardwood, um, the different successional stages. You've got your pioneer species that come in right after uh, the stuff in the middle, and then the climax. Um, I often get asked the question, of "What's the climax for us here in Texas?" I mean, right now it's Yopon. So it depends on what you look at, or how. Or I always say to you, you can possibly what's native or not, whatever. I don't always ask the question of what it's when, you know not more than it is what so anyway so as foresters regardless of whether we're in community forestry or general forestry we measure stuff uh, the stuff I measure isn't for timber products so we're measuring for another reason uh, when we do tree inventories or we do ecosystem basically we're measure the ecosystem uh, values of trees you know we take you know we are measuring the uh, usually typically the diameter or the circumference of a tree, the species, you know, height, stuff like that. And we, we are looking at that for tree benefits as to put, and those benefits are environmental, economic, social, as opposed to, you know, timber and uh, the product value of it. So that's really where that difference is, you know. Um, but we do use some, some of the same tools, uh, diameter tapes, the clinometer, measure height. 
it's an increment board over there. I think I have another slide on that. Um, but in the, in the general forestry stuff, we're using that to measure, you know, how fast the tree is growing, when we really need to harvest, that kind of stuff. Uh, trees per acre. We're you know, this again is a can of tree from a from a timber or, or product standpoint. You know, we, we look at those and how many logs are in the tree. Basically, 16 foot sections or logs. Um, but like I said, when we look at it, we're not looking at logs or merchantable height on trees. We're not measuring them. But uh, and diameter though is pretty much the same either way. Um, but we what we call it, where we measure a tree, it's at DBH, which is diameter at breast height. Obviously, that's going to be different for everybody. That's a general rule. Um, but technically, that's four and a half feet on the trunk, because technically where DBH is. Uh, there's a lot of different rules on where you measure trees, because trees aren't perfect. Um, sometimes they fork or have a, you know, uh, the branch coming out there, or then there's slopes. So there's all different kinds of uh, methods to measure that. Um, but typically, it's four and a half feet. Um, does anyone anyone know why that is? Why is it four and a half feet? Typical breast height. But why? Oh, oh um, wasn't that because guys don't want to have to crouch down? Think about measuring thousands of trees, and you're doing this all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so really, that's why. And also, a lot of a lot of species have that swell, you know, or the trunk swell, or we call uh, that trunk flare, root flare, you know. So. Usually at that height, you're above that, but yeah, so we didn't want to bend it over. <laughs> so, um, now obviously the anchor board, like I said, this isn't something I do on urban trees. You know, we don't put a board <laughs> in the trees typically, um, but in the forestry setting, we look at growth rates. When you pour out a tree, uh, you can look at, you know, you look at those growth rings and see how much they're not growing. You can also see when there's droughts and fires and all kinds of stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Um, when they're doing timber cruising, what we do is we typically look at basal area, which is that basically chunk section of a tree that helps us gauge how much wood is out there, basically. Um, we This tool right here is called a prism. Um, I don't know if pointer doesn't work on here, but it looks like this. So you're basically standing at your plot center, because obviously the most it's not practical to measure every single tree. Um, so we typically view those in plots depending on how big it is. You know, they could be 10th acre, 20th acre plots. And this tool helps, you know, helps you count. So you're not going in back and forth, out, back and forth. You can use that tool and it will say whether or not it's in or out of the, uh, so this, you know, this tree right here would be in, this is out, and this borderline. So you count every other one of those typically in or out. But that's what that tool is used for. And that's really just get a measure of the wood that's out there in trees per acre. Um, so now I'll kind of get a little bit more of what Wendy had wanted me to talk about, and that's you know different tree species throughout this region. Um, we've got some really great tools on our website right now. Um, I don't know if some of y'all probably have used these or may have been a little bit familiar with these. Um, but this is really a great resource, uh, especially for high school kids. Um, pretty user friendly. And it basically kind of teaches you the process of how to identify a tree. And then you can go through step by step, kind of, okay, is this tree, you know, deciduous or is that, or, or not deciduous, but, you know, is it compound leaf, simple leaf, is it, you know, a needle? And then you kind of go through the steps of the different characteristics of that tree or leaf, and it'll get you to, okay, here's what it could be based on the information that you selected. So it's kind of like it's a dichotomous key, but online. <laughs> it's pretty user friendly. Pretty good resource. And basically, all the stuff's on there. So if they're not familiar with some of the terms of what what does alternate mean, what does opposite mean, that's all on there. And uh, it's got visuals for it. Um, and so not only does it have you know the step by step key, um, it has what all the stuff means and what it is. So it's pretty cool. And it's not every single tree, um, obviously. Um, we tried to put things that were common, things that you probably are more readily available at nursery, but we're constantly expanding this. Um, I forget how many species are on now, it's over 100. Um, but it's really cool, you could click one of these, do the custom one, click on the custom. Not only does it have the, um, you know, on selecting a tree, but there's guides on how to properly plant the tree, how to uh, water, maintain it, stuff like that. So all that stuff's on there. Uh, it's a pretty good resource. So if you hit the collect, if you do hit the custom selector, it's really cool. As you can go up the top, you put in the county that you're in or that you're looking at, um, and then basically you just select 
those characteristics or attributes that you're looking for in that tree, you know, is it a small area, uh, you know, and you just kind of go step by step, then you click the thing at the bottom and it says show tree. So based on what is put in right here, um, this is the output. So I'm in Brazos County, I was looking for something with, you know, flowers, wildlife, and tolerate uh, drought conditions and, and the soils outline that it'll boom it'll give you this list of recommended trees for that area. Now I know and there's a lot of talk about earlier restoration and soils and things like that and as I mentioned before mostly the, the what I work in and what I deal with aren't native soils. You know they're disturbed, uh, compacted um, and so I'm typically not dealing with or, or planting, I mean, depending on what the project or site is, I don't have that luxury of having native soils, hardly ever, <laughs> because I, where I mostly do everything is, it's already been disturbed, and, and, and not just disturbed, um, but even worse, compacted. So there's a little, you know, not much space for uh, uh, oxygen and water to get in, so you really have to look at that as well, you know. Um, but anyway, that being said. I'll just kind of, we'll just go over some of the species I have in here. I also do have a, a tree planting guide. Um, some of y'all may have this or have seen this. Pretty cool. Uh, artist Bill O'Brien does these. He lives in Austin, but he does these tree guides all over the United States or everywhere. And what's cool about these, it's got a really cool, colorful poster of his artwork. Um, and then, but what's really cool too is on the back, it has descriptions of the trees, you know, mature size, whatever how to properly plant it, where to plant it, spacing, all that kind of stuff, so it's pretty cool. Now there are some species in this that I don't think should be in here, but Centerpoint Energy paid for that, and they wanted those in there, so we let them. Um, so they, they chose a lot of stuff too that you could plant under, or recommend planting under power lines, so there's a lot of you know, crate minerals, stuff like that that I would, wouldn't necessarily recommend, but they're in there, but it's a cool poster, cool, pretty good it's a resource. Um, but anyway, like I said, I'm going to go through some of the species in our area. And this is uh, probably one of my favorite trees in Texas. Um, bald cypress, I mean, it's also a great tree for urban areas because it has, it's one of the very few trees that can grow in and around standing water. That's why we see it along the rivers and streams. Um, and why it also makes a good urban tree because it's adapted to uh, you know not being able to utilize the oxygen. So compacted soils typically have low oxygen. So the bald cypress do really well. Um, and I know a lot of people will complain, oh, they're going to put up the bees the easier the way, and they, they do that, but only typically when it's very wet. Um, so if you do have a wet area, plant this. Um, but the Montezuma bald cypress. Um, looks very similar to this, just a little bit different in the form, I think. They're a little bit wider and broader than the bald cypress, but it doesn't seem to produce the knees. So if anyone wants to use this tree, but they don't want knees, they're, you know, buy the Montezuma. Oh, and this uh, picture is on the San Bernard River here. It's like 45 minutes from downtown Houston, so pretty cool little river. Um, this is probably our most, obviously our most common pine species, the loblolly pine. It's our native species of, you know, this is probably our Bologna's most for timber production. Um, the columns down there are kind of comparison of the different pines that we have here in East, mostly East Texas. What's uh, the big one? That's a uh, long leaf. Well, what's the, well, no, the fifth one. Oh. I've always done four. The, so we've got long leaf, slash pine, loblolly pine, spruce pine. Oh, spruce pine. And then short leaf pine. Yeah. It's found in Texas? Um, yes. Wow. I, well, planted more than mostly. Oh. Like I found it, like I found one right by my office actually, an office on 610 North of DC Jester, but not, not, not something you'd find out like in the woods, but. Mm -hmm. When I was a catalyst, there's a ton of little baby pine bones. And Canada? Yeah, they may. And Canada. Everything was moving. Yeah, a lot of times when, uh, especially, I mean, any of the pines are really stressed or we have a drought, they'll sometimes not get fully um, developed. So you may see that. Another pine that we see, which is used pretty commonly for Christmas tree production, is Virginia pine. 
Uh, in fact, when I was in college, I worked on a Christmas tree farm, and most of the trees out there were Virginia pine. Um, so, but lava is definitely the most common one um, that we'll see in our area. Um, Eastern red cedar, uh, one of the only other evergreens that kind of looks like a Christmas tree kind of pine. We don't really have those. When you see that typical Christmas tree triangular shaped pine, we don't really have that, but Eastern red cedar, which is actually a juniper, is pretty common in our area. And wood's really cool. You use this for fence posts, it's um, pretty hardy. Doesn't decay really easily, so you see a lot of that for fencing and, and stuff like that. Real pretty wood as well. Um, American elm, pretty common elm species in our region. Um, I think it's underutilized in urban areas, probably due to the scare threat of the Dutch elm disease. Dutch elm disease that's pretty rampant up north uh, in the Midwest, but we we don't really have that here. Um, it's not anything that our American elms get here in our region, um, but it's a really, really cool tree. Um, but yeah, populations of this that were pretty decimated up in the Midwest and North. I mean, whole tree line streets have, have been gone because of that Dutch elm disease. Um, but they have this very kind of base-like shape. They get really big, um, pretty distinct bark. The leaves are real rough, kind of like uh, sandpaper. Um, but underutilized, I think, as far as for planting. Another common uh, elm that we have is a cedar elm. You can find all over Texas, pretty much. Um, but it's pretty fairly common here in Houston. Um, looks kind of similar. They often mistaken for winged elm, which I don't know if I have in here or not. Um, because of the wings on the on the branches or the rachis here, um, and not all of them always have that, but the wing is pretty common on the wing downs as well. But the cedar elms have a much smaller, rounder leaf than the uh, um, than the wing down, and it's a lot rougher to the touch, like uh, kind of like the American elm. And it's pretty; the bark's very different as well. Um, but real common tree here in Texas. Um, so this is. Sugarberry, which also, even on our website, we have hackberry. You tend to find, which are actually different species, um, but here, uh, most, I'd say pretty much all of what we have down here is gonna be sugarberry. Um, as you go up north, you might find some hackberry. I mean, it's really difficult to tell the difference at all, anyway. Um, but very common, common tree here. It's got this kind of, what I call warty bark, real rough bark. I know my son was, what grade he was in, but he did a face plant on a sugarberry because oh he wasn't paying attention and he was running and he hit one of those and he he, he remembers this tree. So because <laughs> <laughs> these, these works on here are real hard too, they're not just they don't just flake off. So is the nutmeg crackberry one of these as well or is that another That is a, that's another one also. Um, but they all tend to get <coughs> together. But the one that's here is, is this technically this the um uh, got which is the sugar berry. But even here, you'll hear people just say hackberry, but we kind of just want them all together. Then. But uh, pretty much what we have here is the sugar berry. This is a really dense wooded species as well. I mean, probably not the tree you want to have right next to your house or your or your driveway. Um, they tend to have a lot of issues with decay as they mature, and when they drop limbs, they're heavy. Um, obviously, we probably all know this one. We should all know this one. Um, probably one of our most common trees, and, and for a good reason, probably one of our hardiest and longest lived oaks down here in the south. I mean, it is it is the long, you know longest lived one here, and that's that picture on the left was in the Glenwood Cemetery in the Heights, where uh, you know his grave there, kind of famous guy, Howard Hughes. The tree is right, but the tree is pretty close to where his his site is. Uh, it's a beautiful tree. It used to be our county champion uh, live oak, but we found bigger ones now. There's some actually really big, cool trees in that cemetery. I go in there all the time. We found some of our county champions. I'll talk about it in a second. Too. Water oak, really common tree in Texas, all over Texas. Not really sure why they call it water oak. Um, I mean, because <laughs> it seems to not like really wet. Like <laughs> we had the floods and flooding. This is one of the trees we see you go first. Um, and then it was one of the trees we saw have a huge loss during the drought. So trying to still figure out where this water, why this tree gets, and it's not necessarily found near in areas that are wetter. I mean, it is, but it also will grow on higher dry sites. So I've always been wondering why it's called that. 
But what's interesting about the water oak is these are all water oak. It has, you know, sometimes I'll look at a water oak and I'm like, what is this tree? Um, they, they can have all these on the same tree as well. That, you know, their, their leaf shape varies probably more than any other oak species that, that's in our area. Um, but you can really tell the, the bark's pretty distinct. It has this kind of tannish gray stripes that go along it. So that always helps identify. Um, but one of the issues too with water oaks, another tree I would recommend planting near your house or your uh, structure or anything like that because they're not super long lived and when they get probably 40, 50, 60 years old, they're riddled with decay. Um, and, and you might not see it. Um, it might be in the interior, you don't really know unless you have someone look at it or know what you're looking at. So we see a lot of issues with this tree and the tree service companies deal with this tree every day because it's, it's got a lot of problems. But basically, unlike the live oak, what happens with live oak, they can, when it gets a wound or they lose a branch or which is a, could be a wound, a pruning wound or anything, it's able to compartmentalize over that wound. Whereas for some reason, the water oak's just really inefficient at doing that. And by the time it does, there's already decay in there, you know, decay fungus. Getting into that, but for, for whatever reason, or well, there's different oak species, red oaks and white oaks, but, um, but the live oak tends, and that's why they're really long lived, they tend to, to, to wall off. And I always tell people trees don't heal, they seal. Right? You know, just like we heal, we get a cut. Trees actually don't heal. They compartmentalize that, which is one of their evolutionary wonders, and can contain that so decay doesn't spread up and down throughout the tree. But they're actually, you know, you'll, you cut into a tree and you're going to find that wound in there, but it was sealed. Um, they don't heal. So, anyway. Um, willow, pretty another one. This is one that we typically do find in more wet areas. Uh, a lot of people do mistake this with water oak, or they call this pin oak, which actually pin oak is a completely different, that's why we go by scientific names too, because there's a lot of different common names for trees, um, but I hear people say pin oak all the time, and that's not a native species of Texas, it's a little further northeast, um, and I, but I have seen some and planted, um, but willow oak is a native uh, that you find typically in wetter areas. But the reason they call it willow oak, obviously, is that long, kind of linear leaf. So if you see that, um, then it's probably a willow oak. But they're typically all like that. A lot of times I'll see people call the water oaks willow oaks, because water oaks can have leaves that look just like this. Um, but typically they'll have the other leaves too. So. But it's pretty common here. Uh, swamp chestnut oak, really cool tree. Um, this is one too, I think, that's completely underutilized. It's actually a really good urban tree. Um, pretty tough. Uh, it's beautiful fall color almost every year, which is pretty rare here in Texas. Or it just depends on the year, really. I mean, some years we'll have great fall color, others we won't see any at all. But this is one that's pretty solid on the fall color. Um, and this is a this is one that you witness. You know, the name fits this one. This is one that you find in really wet areas near near uh, water. Another really common oak especially here on this campus, is the post oak. Um, the post oak, it's, you know, it's interesting, this tree, for whatever reason, does not like site disturbance. Um, you know, we've named half of Houston, or parts of Houston after this tree, um, and yet with development and construction, this tree just doesn't take it well. It doesn't, you know, compaction and, and water, changes in the water, um, just the tree doesn't like it. So what we're seeing is we're losing a lot of post oaks, and this is one of the very few trees you can find in a nursery. They just can't find them. Because um, I think they, they look really kind of straggly and not like a tree that you'd want when they're young. So I think growers and nursery guys don't really deal with it because no one's going to buy it. Right? Um, but unfortunately, uh, like I said, I, we're losing way more of these than are being planted, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. Is this the one that's growing up with the plants in, East, uh, um, in the Texas? I saw a lot of people yeah. like that. Yeah, that you'll, what grows up with what? You'll, see, you'll see these pretty much all over Texas. I mean, they grow down here, they grow up East Texas. They're, they're pretty, as them far them as they're... And then you also see them out in prairie. Like, um, but like yeah, like I said, it's just one that doesn't like site changes. Um, and these are also the ones that you typically see. They have really kind of gnarly 
form, especially like out towards like College Station, and you'll when, in the winter it's really cool because when these lose all their leaves, they're the trees that kind of look all gnarly and are growing in all different directions. That's probably why they're not commonly planted, but um, we do have a lot of these here. And these a little bit tougher than the, as far as the wood goes, a little bit tougher than the than the water oaks a little bit. Uh, another one of my favorite trees, the bur oak. Um, this tree is solid. I mean, it's we consider like our bulletproof trees. This would be one of them. Um, they're a little slower growing than some of the other oaks, but and the other thing is they have they have the largest acorn out of all the oaks in our area. When these acorns are bigger than golf balls, so it's not about something you want on a tree line street or next to the structure, but great tree, good fall color usually. Probably underutilized here. Um, another one of the common red oaks that we have uh, here in our area, and I don't know if I have the other one, the nut all oak, but very similar to the shumard oak. I might have it on me. Um, but probably more typical of what you think of a red oak. A lot of people, this does kind of look like a pin oak leaf, uh, what, what, or what an actual pin oak looks like. Um, but another great tree, probably don't, they're a little bit pickier with the soil and the pH, so you'll see a lot of these uh, yellow, get yellow or have chlorosis, what we call chlorosis. And that's mainly a pH problem in this a little. Um, cherry bark oak, this is a pretty common tree in Armand, but I don't know if, did Tom already do his? I don't know if he talked yet, but there's uh, our champion Cherry bark oak tree is on our, the Armand Bayou uh, Nature Preserve there, um, or Nature Center. And there actually used to be two, I think we lost one of them in the Hurricane, the, or Hurricane Ike actually. Um, but this is a tree that an oak that you typically see in more wet areas. Um, also, this one on the bottom is Southern Red Oak. I know they changed the species. Uh, they're always constantly changing the species on some of these trees, and I think this one changed um, but very similar to this one is the southern red oak. They're usually not found as, as in, or not as, as wet, um, but pretty similar to the cherry bark oak. Um, those are two fairly common oaks. In, in so Matt, I'm going to uh, expose my age here. Back when I was taking dendrology at A&M back in the 80s, uh, or is it just the fact that I took it at A&M? Uh, cherry bark and southern red were Southern red was a uh, main species, cherry bark was a subspecies, yeah. so now it's different. Yeah. So, yes. So, I, when, when I was in school in the late or mid 90s, mm -hmm. they were both separate. There's Quercus falcata and Quercus pagoda. Right. Last I looked, I think they're still, I think they're separate. But like I was said, like you said, I think at one point, yeah, it was a go to variety Falcata or right. other way around. Yeah, yeah. So it was about, it was and I think, right up yeah, so I think this is how it is now. Okay. But Thank you're right. You. That's, that's why I was saying that. I can't remember which was which, but, and that tends to happen, but you can tell these are pretty, I mean, these are different trees based on, well, leaf shapes similar, but not right. same, but really different sites. I mean, you find that cherry bark, cherry, uh, cherry bark oak, a lot more on the wetter and that's why you see this big swell here because this is probably an area that it stays pretty wet and floods so it's got a pretty big trunk root layer on it um just another uh, common probably understory or edge tree that we have here uh eastern redbud there's also texas redbud it's pretty hard to tell the difference though but um one of the first trees to flower in spring so we probably notice this one um let's get understory smaller tree, get for under power lines or in small spaces. Southern wax myrtle, another native. Um, it's a great screen or so it, it grows really fast. In fact, I put one, I, have a, I live near downtown, so I would, wouldn't even call it a yard, but put this in their little area that we have to cover our air conditioning unit. And I was amazed. I mean, that thing's already up to the top of our house. And it only gets about 25, 30 feet at maturity, so it's a good for the smaller areas, good for wildlife, and it's evergreen. So, and it's a native, so it's pretty cool. Um, but it can often look very shrub-like if you don't do anything to it. But they can be uh, pruned up into really nice small trees. So, when did they change the genus name? Because it used to be Myrica. Yeah, that's another, but not that long ago actually. Because really? I learned it as Myrica, the genus Myricus or 
So that was probably just within the last few years. Okay. We have one of those trees right outside the Yeah. Yeah, this is also this right. Take some of the leaves and this is really it's a really fragrant leaf. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. And that's fruit over there. It's a good wildlife bird feed or bird uh, habitat or Anaqua, uh, probably, I've, I've, from what I've researched on this, it says that we have this in Harris County, or, you know, but I'm not, it's a little bit further south, uh, south, southwest. Um, I was in Victoria after Hurricane Harvey, and there were some beautiful, huge uh, Anaquas, like, everywhere. So this is a pretty common tree that way. Um, but we still, they do very well here, or at least I, from what I've seen, I've got some in my office complex. And uh, that's actually my son. <laughs> and that is the Harris County champion in Aqua. Um, he gets, my wife teaches at Travis Elementary in the Heights, and my kids have gone there. And I did a tree survey inventory of all the trees in the school and happened to run into this one. And I'm like, man, this is like probably the largest one I've ever seen. So it's now our Harris County champion there in the parking lot. But I also call the sandpaper tree. The leaf's really rough. Uh, it's got really pretty white <coughs> and it's a really hardy tree and it does pretty well here. Um, <coughs> these, these often will grow up kind of wild in weird places and or, or old cleared ag land or something. But we do plant these and they do tend to do well. Another species are probably more common as you go west. Uh, um, but the Palo Verde is another uh, common name for this. Uh, the Tama and then Jerusalem form, they're all the same. Um, but pretty distinct tree. I mean, it's got that really kind of green, green twig, green bark, and it's really pretty when it flowers. It's bright yellow, and really interesting uh, seed pods there. Um, another one of my favorites, uh, the red maple. Um, typically, naturally occurs in more wet areas as well, um, but there are some varieties that do pretty good here in the urban, and that's why I put uh, probably in, he in the Houston area uh, the. Jermundi variety is probably the one that does best, but you go to a nursery and they have like all these crazy names, some, you know, Autumn Blaze and all these things that really market towards the color, and they just don't tend not to do as well as the uh, Jermundi uh, variety. But another one of my favorite trees, probably one of these when my son was born, it's now like over our second story house in a few years, so it's pretty fast growing. It's opposite. One of the few opposite trees, so most opposite trees that we have are going to be maples and ash trees. Um, and I'll talk about the ash in a minute, but, and then, but most everything else is alternate. Um, sweet gum, which often gets mistaken for maple, um, and now you can tell the difference, obviously the fruit's really different, but these are alternate as opposed to the maples being the opposite arrangement. Um, and we've all stepped on those seed pod deals. Um, but now they actually make a seedless variety of this tree. But the leaf even looks way different than this one. Um, but this is what it looks like in the native. So, you know, back in the day when I was in the scouts, they taught us you could use that to skewer stuff that you were going to cook over an open fire, not worry about the sap. Is that true? Are there other trees in the forest you could do that with, or is it a myth? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, I think that is uh, true. I think, um, but. That is why it's called sweet gum. I mean, they, they have a pretty high sap content, so I think that's probably, it wouldn't burn maybe as like the other ones, and, or it has a lot more moisture. So, but I haven't actually heard that about sweet gum. Um, you use something like a tongue nut tree to wind up with a toxicity yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I don't that. think, I mean, as far as I know, I don't think they're, you know, toxic if you're using it for that or whatever. I mean, I haven't heard that, but, um, but, um, but yeah, it's pretty common tree here in our area. And of course, I do have to talk about some of the now native <coughs> invasive species of true raw. And this is another one that changed the scientific name on not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> I always forget that. But, um, but yeah, this is our famous or infamous, however you want to look at it, uh, Chinese tallow tree, which unfortunately in this region makes up one of the, you know, the population makes up close to, uh, well, not quite a quarter, but um, it's getting there, and it's one of the most common trees now. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a, a, one of our programs is uh, FIA, which is forest, forest, forest Inventory Analysis, and so we now have an urban FIA program 
we did Austin a couple of years ago, and now we just did Houston, and the data is out for that. And I don't know if I put the link on here, but if you Google like Urban FIA Houston, um, the PDF report is on online, and I can send that link to you as well. I'm going to do that actually, but I don't know if I remember to put it in here. Um, but it's probably the most current, up-to-date um, data and report on the Houston area. We only, with this one, we only looked at the city of Houston. Um, I mean, we, we have done this all over the state of Texas, but now we're doing it in urban. Like Austin was the first one ever. Um, they were going to do it in Baltimore, but they said it would take over five years, and we're like, well, we're just going to do it. And we collected all the data in one summer and had the report out the next year. Um, and uh, we just did Houston, and we're doing Dallas or San Antonio, and then I think Dallas Fort Worth. And what this is going to provide is we're, we'll and we'll do this data collection every five years for each of the major cities. So we can really monitor um, the change um, and just, you know, because every plot is going to be the same forever. So it doesn't matter if there's a building there or those trees now, and then there'll be a building. We're going to, you know, keep those same plots. We're going to come back to them every five years. And, you know, we're going to be able to give you, I mean, it's really interesting to report. I mean, it breaks down species. Um, and then we've also done environmental benefits, um, you know, energy savings, uh, stormwater interception, all those are in that report. And it's really interesting. Um, and right now we're currently at, um, uh, I don't know exactly where, but I want to say we're at 18.2 or something percent canopy. And that's fairly low um, or lower than what we had hoped. Um, that's for Houston. Yeah, for the Houston region right now. Um, and when we did, and the other studies that we've done in the past look at it more regionally, so we can't really compare them directly. Um, but at the study that was done probably in the late 90s, um, at that point we were losing, and we had from the 70s to the almost 2000s, we had lost 17% of our mm -hmm. canopy. And now we're only at like 18 something, or I think that's somewhere I could do that look at it. But, um, but it's just interesting, you know, and, and you know, we are obviously losing quite a bit of our canopy, not just in Houston, but throughout the world. Um, it's kind of scary. But yeah, this is an invasive species. It really kind of came in hard here when all that, especially as you go further south, uh, southwest. Um, all that old abandoned ag land, that and that land that was farmed for something, got changed ownership, wasn't used for agriculture or production, and boom, this tree just came in and, and took over. And it's, you know, we spent millions and millions of dollars trying to control and eradicate it, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But here's another one that's uh, non native. I'm starting to see a little more pop up here and there. And one good thing about this is it doesn't like freezing temperatures. So the, I think the freezes that we do have uh, have kept this guy kind of at bay. Um, but this is camphor tree. This is actually the Harris County Champion in the Heights right here, like 30 some inches in diameter. I've never seen one that big because they always tend to freeze back. So it's, anyway, but this is the one they use like in Vicks Vapor Rub. Like you break up a camphor leaf and it smells just like Vicks Vapor Rub. So this is one of the natural or the products that we get from the country. Um, here's another invasive from Asia. Um, see these everywhere too. This is China berry. Um, very interesting leaf. All that, that, that that's being held right there is actually the leaf. Um, it's like tripinately compound I believe. Um, and all those individual things on there are what we call the leaflets. So like say like a pecan or you know when it has a compound leaf one of those isn't the leaf, all those make up the leaf, and then those are leaflets. But that's actually one leaf on the china berry. Um, but you see the fruit. But it's uh, starting to see this a lot more too. Um, we have a problem, another, uh, you know, another, let's talk about Yopon. This guy is kind of, yeah, I guess the non-native uh, invasive, uh, similar to Yopon, uh, except it's opposite. That's how you tell this from Yopon. I mean, obviously the berries are a different color, but these uh, all of the rest of them 
and Privet are opposite, where the leaves are directly opposite one another, whereas you upon they're alternate. Um, but this is really common um, everywhere. You see a ton of this. I see some on the campus here as well. Um, stuff's everywhere. And then as I mentioned, here's our Yopon on our native. Uh, but like I said, you can tell it's alternate. They're not coming off directly one another. And of course, the berries are totally different color. And I don't, the, I don't know if you can see that, but the species name for this is Vomitoria. And it, so I think when, when people see that, they often tend to think that, well, if you eat the berries, it's going to make you vomit. Um, but really, the Native Americans used to make tea out of it, and they would use this as a cleansing. And so when the sellers came over and they saw them doing that, they just said, oh, stay away from this tree because it's going to make you, you know. But they would take it in excess amounts, probably with like anything that you would do that much to cleanse your system. But the seed itself is not necessarily toxic in the sense that, you know, it's a good wildlife food. And so folks are making tea out of the yopon leaves. It would be great if we could figure out a, a good uh, economic <laughs> uh, avenue for this because it's everywhere. And, it, it, and then when we did our urban FIA, this was the most common tree species for the yopon. It's it's it does make a great tree. It's um, this obviously this is our state tree. Come, got to put that in there. Like I mentioned, you know that whole thing right there is one leaf and those are leaflets. Um, pretty common here, yeah. or in all over mm -hmm. Texas, really. Um, American sycamore, um, pretty common tree. You often see these in riparian areas as well. It tends to like those sandier, well-drained soils. What we're seeing in the nursery industry and in the urban areas is the Mexican sycamore. Um, seeing that being pretty much taking over where uh, the American sycamore. And the reason for that is they, the American sycamores, and especially in urban areas, tend to get leaf anthracnose, um, bacterial leaf scorch, where the leaves a lot of times in the summer look like almost like it's fall and they just don't look good. And we're not seeing that. Um, as being as prevalent in the Mexican sycamore, so we're starting to see a lot more. It's really hard, I mean, it's you can tell the difference between the two, the Mexican is a little bit darker green leaf on the top and a little more gray on the bottom. Bark's almost the same, but it's really the leaf shape and the leaf color that's a little bit different. But this is the American one, the, the native one. Really cool bark. And it's got those little balls with all the seeds in it. Uh, this is Eastern Cottonwood, another one that um, a lot of times you'll find near water. Um, this is another tree too, when it gets real big and mature, it tends to start falling apart and dropping huge limbs. I mean, these guys can get pretty massive in size, but you, a lot of times you'll find them. And, and then near, uh, I think our county champion is right near Buffalo Bayou, near downtown. Um, this is another tree too that you don't see a lot of other trees around it. I think they have the, what we call the lepathy, where they put out certain chemicals to help control other trees growing around it. So you'll usually see these in little bunches and then you won't really see anything else. So, um, so I think I'm getting towards the end here. But. Black Willow, uh, another native. This is the one that you really see literally growing like on the banks of riparian areas or, or, or rivers or creeks or whatever you want to call them. Um, and this is also a tree that grows, I mean you could take a twig <coughs> off of a black willow and stick it in the ground if it stays moist you can grow a tree. It's, it propagates really readily, um, but not super, super long lived. Um, you know, they like I said, they'll come in wet areas and get out. And people are using a lot for erosion control and to get banks stabilized because they grow so fast and propagate really easily. Um, that's one of our few willow species that we have that's native. And of course, probably not as common here, but we do have it. Um, the fact that our county champion, and I, yeah, our county champion skeet is on the campus at U of H. Um, pretty cool, but the tree actually kind of fell over at one point, but now it's still growing. And But it's trunk on it's like this big, it's huge. A lot of landowners, ranchers, they don't like this tree, they clear it out. It can be kind of messy and it's got thorns and it's, you know, get into the mess of these, it can be quite painful. Um, but pretty common tree here. And then I think it's one of the last ones I have, so I don't know, so we only have a couple minutes, but towards the end here. So this is a green ash, as I mentioned before, one of the few opposite tree species that we have. When I say opposite, remember the branching. Um, 
And so and the reason that's this often gets misidentified with all kinds of stuff that have leaves like the hickories and the you know pecan, all the leaves that kind of look like that, but you know it's an ash because it's opposite. Um, so what's interesting about this tree and why I have this little guy right there. Does anyone know what that is? This insect down here. All right. Yeah, I'm glad some of you guys have heard of it. That's cool. So emerald ash borer, which another species came, came over from Asia, uh, apparently in some wood crate packaging material, um, has really decimated the ash population uh, well, in the Midwest, Northeast. I mean, I think it's in like 27 or 28 states now um, and just came to Texas two years ago. So we do now have, um, well, we Unfortunately, we were one of the few states that knew this bug was coming, and so we kind of started a program a few years ago, uh, raising awareness to communities about this, that it's coming, um, and then we really took a look at some of our data to look at ash populations across the state, um, and it's not, it's probably not even five or so percent of the tree species across the state. However, when you go into the urban areas, I don't know if you know from the Meyer land, some of these older areas where it was planted with Arizona ash, which is not our native and another tree that has a lot of issues at maturity, not recommended, um, are probably 90% ash, you know. So in urban areas, it's a little different, so we're really starting to kind of look at that. Um, although it is in Texas, it's right kind of on the border of Texas and Louisiana. And the good news is we, since we discovered it, we've only found it in traps. We haven't found any infestations in any trees around the area, which is really weird. So we're not really even sure what this insect's going to do when it does get here. But this can be transported in firewood, and that's really how it spread throughout the United States. In fact, I heard that it got started in Louisiana because some guys in Michigan brought it in firewood to, a deer, to the deer lease. Um, this is also something that... <laughs> kind of interesting that if you go to any, I don't know if you're, any of you guys are in the NASCAR, but if you go to any of the races, there's emerald ash borer signs up all over. And that's because for whatever reason, these people traveling around the different races like to bring the wood from their land or their property. And so they're bringing and spreading emerald ash borer around the country with NASCAR. So this is a native oak tailgate? Yeah, so the, yeah, the green ash is pretty common here. Um, yeah, this is our native. Uh, we do have white ash as well that's a native. A lot less common probably than the green ash, but this is probably our most common ash. I mean, because that looks a lot like the Arizona ash seed. So what's yeah. the difference? How do you tell the difference? So the, so the seeds on all the ashes are pretty similar, except for the wafer ash. They actually look more like wafers. Um, but I think, to me, the bark on a green ash is way more, is, I think, more furrowed and deep. Like those, like, it's deeper furrowed, I think, and more of, like, a... It's more kind of yellowish than, like, Yeah, the, it's uh, more of a pattern where, okay. like, the Arizona seems more sporadic, and then they have smooth patterns. Whereas a green ash will be pretty uniform like that, and they're deeper furrows. Okay. Also, the leaf um, number of leaflets on the leaf varies between different ash species, and I think the Arizona you typically find more five than the seven. Um, so it's it's leaflets. The barks to me are different, and then and the, kind of the form as well. Uh, the Arizona ash seems to be more spreading and broad. Whereas, this is more yeah. Matt, you were saying something about the five, it was uh, the ash population rurally is 5% versus 90%. Somewhere around that. Well, I, I throw 90 out there saying, like, looking at a specific neighborhood. So right. In general, and we even think this in our urban area. So we looked at our FIA data throughout the state, and then we looked at known inventories of mm -hmm. cities and communities that we had and there even that ash population is probably somewhere around six seven whatever it's in that five range um but that's only on those inventories and um that we know of or communities that we know that actually have an inventory which isn't a lot it's not so we so that number is similar in the rural urban I'm just thinking here in Houston, in fact, we did get, uh, we've been working with the city of Houston to develop a plan, and yeah, there's neighborhoods that have, like, you know, way higher ash populations. Yeah, I know that in wide places. So, um, and green ash, I think, is a little more common down here in our 
large air, natural areas or right. managed areas than I think in a lot of other parts of Texas. So I don't know how you know those numbers are, but but even you know we we even did the numbers just based on that, and you're looking at millions of dollars that you know some communities might have to deal with, with especially with a city like Houston. Um, so you know, like I said, we're we're it could be two, three, four years or whatever when that's actually here in our region, but we're you know like I said we're looking out for it and. We're, but it could be some guy that drove down and brought it here. So you, you just never know. Um, but it's kind of made its way here. It's in Arkansas, it's in Louisiana, so we knew it was going to be here eventually. But like I said, it's kind of interesting. That, you so know, it's in all the major NASCAR states? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it, you know, it does travel. I mean, the insects themselves travel once it's once they're established. So it's not just the firewood, but the firewood has definitely accelerated it sure. for sure. And I mean, you know, there's streets that are just lined with ash trees up in the Midwest and North that have had to, you know, it, like I said, fortunately, we, we've been able to see what's happened and taken the research and and, and kind of got it down to where here's how you should really deal with it. And so Chestnut Street has be, wait, became <laughs> Elm Street and yeah. become Ash Street. And now what's going to be done? Yeah, I, I don't know. Desert. And that's, so, a, that's a, you know, it brings up a good point. You know, it's one of those where we really emphasize diversity of when you're doing plantings in urban areas because of that. And, you know, if you did your whole neighborhood in one species, so then it comes in and boom, you're gone. So you really have to diversify your species uh, when it comes to planting, especially in urban areas. Sage Honey did 2,000 trees for 2,000, mm -hmm. and they got they planted red nut everywhere. And I thought, what are you doing? It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And that's all they planted. They planted all these red nuts because they were shorter. So they wouldn't get into the lines so those early, yeah. but I don't know. And they're hardly any of them native. Yeah, it's so it's hard, especially you know, like, you know, a lot of landscape architects. I mean, you know, they like uniformity. They like you know, and a lot of times that doesn't work. And we're we're hardly ever involved in the planning stage where they'll come in and say, well, here's why this happened. <laughs> So um, anyway, I, I mentioned the tree registry. We have a state tree registry. One of the cool things I get to do is go out and look for big trees. Um, we've got a, like I said, we, Harris County has a registry. We, TFS basically manages the state one. And then there's a national tree registry. Um, this is a, a book that came out. The, this is the newest edition of Famous Trees of Texas. Uh, I think it came out in the 60s or 70s at some point, the original version, and there's a lot of trees in there that aren't there anymore, and so we updated a couple years ago, Pete Smith and Gretchen Riley, and uh, at the time on our agency worked on that. Pretty cool book. Um, you can purchase that, I think, through the a and Press. I, see, I still see some of the old copies that use at the High Price Books in the bookstore, so I try to get those. It's kind of cool. It's out of print, but anyway, all that can be found online as well. I think I'm pretty much done here. One resource was Besides the uh, inventory, the forest inventory report that I'll, I'll get you the link on, so we have a great uh, Texas Forest Info. There's a lot of great resources for, for, your, for you guys and your students to use on there. Um, you can map your property. Um, you know, it's got stuff on timber prices. There's our tree trails thing on here, which now has a high school curriculum that goes along with it. It's really cool if you have it, check that out. Uh, My City's Trees up. Um, on some of the major cities, you can look at some of the data that we've collected and, and all that. So this is a great resource. Um, I highly encourage you to use it, um, especially now that we have a lot of stuff geared towards the high school kids. Um, that, that's it. Oh, this, if anyone wants to, obviously that's Bald Cypress. This is on the San Bernard River too. Probably one of the biggest ones I've ever seen, um, right on the river. And as you can see, I think this was at one point all one tree. The middle part either fell, blew out, whatever. Um, but you can see how ginormous that is. And this is all hollow. Up there. You can literally get up in that tree. And some of the knees on that thing are were taller than me. So it's <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? No questions. Well, thank you.